Welcome to the Rugby Bits podcast. And we have an exciting um, episode for us today. We're going to be talking about the French Top 14 playoffs. We're going to be talking about the last round of Super Rugby, the second last round of the Curry Cup, and everything that's happening in the rugby world this week. I am Tyler. I'm hosting this podcast today. I'm joined by Cooks and Sean. Sean, let's start with you. How are you doing today? I'm fantastic. Thank you. How are you? And welcome, everyone. Um, thanks for having me again. Um, yeah, I'm good. You're part I'm of actually, rugby bits. We have to have you. I know. I know. Sorry. Well, geez. <laughs> now, I, now I kind of feel like I'm here only because. Uh, maybe maybe <laughs> she might have to take us offline and just maybe like let me know that I... it's only it's only jared we have to invite everyone else has to be here yes yeah, see i'm so jealous that eh? jared's in the bush at the moment um mm. yeah i hope he's having a good time but secretly i hope it's hailing um yeah good eh? <laughs> just trying to stay warm it's been um it's been kind of cold in the cape um cold and wet it's been uh I don't know how else to, it's just been shitting down with rain is, is the only way I can explain it. Like there's been sideways rain and things have been flooding and trees have been blowing over and all that sort of jazz, but, um, survived had a uh, oxtail pot and sadza yesterday for lunch, Ooh. which was flipping. Oh, nothing. It was the best. It was the best. I, I just sat down and it was cold and everything. And I, and I ate and it was, it was like comfort food, like, was the best and i had it for lunch again today and it was mm-hmm. i had the same vibes i had the same feelings it was oh man i could eat that all week but other than that's good I, I watched quite a bit of the um french rugby this weekend the top 14 I, I watched both of the um the barrage games and then the um the access game the playoff game so it was, it was so good to watch um a good weekend of of french rugby as opposed to little drips and drabs but yeah and you? Yeah, all good. Also freezing my tail off in Cape Town here. Yeah? Um, yeah, I think it's a weird weekend, and I think we're going to go into a bit of an off-season feel. You can see with all the composite fifteens that people are making on Twitter. Yes, we'll talk about that in a moment as well. <laughs> the fully, Nothing. at least in the sort of the northern hemisphere people, the UK and the South African Twitter rugby <laughs> Twitter people, we're fully into the off-season right now. Nothing, yeah, nothing screams off season than <laughs> than these these rounds of of fifteens that are doing. There's been some flipping brilliant ones, which I know you want to talk about. But ah, uh, like a team of the European team of the of the of the season. Um, if you had to pick a Springbok side now, what would it look like? Blah blah blah. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. The, so true. All those tweets are happening this week. Cooks, thank you for joining us. Um, we don't have to pay you to to come here, so at least we we can we can get you in. How are you doing? <laughs> and I'm all good. I'm all good. I'm still. I'm Jared's in the bush, so I'm still here for a bit. The moment he's back, then I make I make my I make my exit stage left. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> Finn, Finn had a great game this weekend. That's why you're here. Like, let's be honest. I see you. We I told all you last you. week. I, 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 no, but I said last week that I do want Racing Metro to get to the final and then lose in the last minute to a horrific, horrific decision. Not bringing Finn to Joe, but those <laughs> bastards. But um, don't get me going. I'm in, a, I'm in a good mood. I'm in a good space. I had the weekend off on um, the weekend, so I got to to chill. I, I, so I've got, I've got no, I've got no, I've got no, no veins today. You know, nothing to be angry about. All's good in the world, except for one oak. Well, actually, no, I do have, I have one little rant. You know, I was out on the weekend. <laughs> of course, I, was, I went to. On Saturday, I was watching the the football, and then obviously I had a few cold ones. But like, I don't mind like speaking to people and speaking about rugby. But like, sometimes like at half past eleven, I'm, from, I'm just chilling, having a beer, you know, chilling my missus. I don't think that's a good time to be talking about what's, what what the boxing doing in the World Cup. At the time, I just don't care. Like, I'll care tomorrow <laughs> on the Sunday. So guys, so this guys having a deep conversation with me. He's like, yes, like because I'm, my girlfriend is next to me. So we're having like good drinks, guys. Like, sorry to bother you. This I want to ask you, like, what do you think? What do you think of the box chances this year in the World Cup? Like. What can you expect? I'm like, oh, we'll see. Then he like he sits, then he, then he sits down. I'm like, my man, <laughs> <laughs> so my man. <laughs> yeah, I had a long chat with this guy, and then he invited his fr- his mate over with his podcast as well. And he, then he wanted to do hey. but he, 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 he doesn't like Damien Williams, so, so we him and I had a, a oh. quite a heated argument. Yeah, he was saying Damien Williams is overrated. I was like, I don't know what, wow. I, I don't know what to say. I was like, I don't know what to say sure. to you now. But, uh, yeah, it's it tough. I was going to say, t- let's, 
I was going to say quickly, shameless pl- plug his podcast, but now I'm not so sure. No, no, no I'm let's. Sure. I'm not so sure we must, <laughs> I, I'm, You know, the thing is that I, I love having these conversations with people because I just, I just want to know why. So often, you know, you know, I mean, I've, I've chatted, like we chat obviously a lot on WhatsApp and my whole big thing is, is like, do you, do you not like him or do you honestly think he's a bad player? Because if, mm-hmm. if your answer is like, I do not like the guy, then that's cool. Then don't like him. But then you've got to give him kudos when he plays well. You can be like, listen, he's playing really well. He deserves to play for the Springboks, but I don't like him. But you can't say he mustn't go to the World Cup because I don't like him. It doesn't make sense. Like we're not here. <laughs> yeah, it's not exactly. a personality yeah. World Cup. This is a rugby World Cup or a, or a URC. Cup like, no, I agree with you. And it's like, that's why I'm like, I, I, I genuinely, genuinely don't, I genuinely do, don't mind talking about rugby if I'm out and all that, but it's always tough when, I'm with the missus. See, I've had a good weekend. That's, that's, if that's my rent, it means I've had a very positive weekend. You know, everything was great. And, um, but actually, there'll be a good first phase question like, just to ask people, like, what, like, what does, what can, what does someone say, like, to, like, this guy, like, you're like, this guy doesn't know his rugby. Or, like, there's always this, there's certain players mm-hmm. where people say, you're like, oh, man, like, like we, we're lying to each other now. Like, let's, like, if you're going to have a chat about rugby, let's, like, let's be honest with each other. Like, so when people like, we're talking about Owen Farrell, I was like, oh, this guy's a knob. I'm like, okay, cool. I, I get that, but he's a good rugby player, though. Like, like, two things can be true. And I'm like, no, he's not. You know, like, why is he not good? Because he's a dick. I'm like, I don't understand that. <laughs> that, that, that that doesn't make sense to me, though. Like, <laughs> like, like, tell me, like, a, a what can I do with rugby ball? And then, uh, I think that there'll be a, a good, a good first phase question to ask. So I'm sure there'll be, there'll be plenty. Just like, and someone says me, someone goes to me, like, hey, I think Fergus Blake is good. I stop listening to you. No, I'm just talking. Just talking <laughs> to you, talking about rugby. Um, oh, do you, do you remember? Do you remember the podcast? Because I'm super keen to listen. No, I don't know. I'm actually fine. I think he did follow me on Instagram, so I'll, I'll, I'll have to go find it. Yeah, but I'm sure they'll listen. Yeah, and you'll if, look... if they are listening to this, then you must just pop us a message on socials. We want to listen yes. and spread the word. He's a very angry guy. He's like a very angry guy. Like, just like it's those guys, like, you know, like... Oh, shame. Like... Like just like like what did you do? This like just gets like very hyped up, and I'm like, oh man, what like why are you so angry? Like what did you like? What does this guy do to you? Like it's a thing of like, no, you must pay five to collect, but he always gives a damn ball. No, like, whoa, my man, whoa, 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 whoa. Like let's talk. Like I'm I'm picking. I'm not the coach. Like just relax. Like just whew. like let's speak normal. Like let's like 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 normal human beings here. Like. He's a very, uh, he's a must be very, he's a very angry human being. I don't know what the box, like, I don't think he knows the box in the World Cup last four, four years ago. I feel like he fell asleep one day, he forgot about that part. Because he's very angry at the moment. <laughs> Can I take a, tell a very quick story about angry people? So obviously we were at the um, URC final um, last weekend and we were sitting just, you know, at the first level, um, like, basically the row at the start of the concession, like concourse. So we're close to like, basically like security people and other people trying to look over us to watch all that sort of stuff. So you hear each and every opinion on rugby over there. So this particular guy, I don't know what got into it, but it was during the time when um, Munster had the try disallowed from um, when uh, Coombs went over for the double movement and Rose got the yellow card and there's a disallowed try for the forward pass. So he had a lot to say about the refs and everything. Then he just went on a rant about swearing about everything about the United Kingdom. So he was like, yeah, you know what? F the Queen, F Prince Ch- or King Charles, F Kate Middleton, F um, Love Actually, what? and, um, and what, what's her name? Um, Kieran Knightley as well, F Man City, F Chelsea, F London Bridge. Like he went on everything. And I was like, look, my guy, okay, I don't know where Kira Knightley comes into this, number one. Number two, none of these things that you saw in that are Irish. All that you've talked about now are your English things. What are you talking about, bro? What? He was heated for those five minutes. I don't know where he went, but he then sort of <laughs> spread his, like, anger somewhere else. So, Cooks, I know one, one or two things about angry people in the last few weeks. And it's always... Yeah, I think I've gotten to this place with like, obviously Storm was on my team, so I wasn't like too sad when they were losing. But yes, the 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 the, the swear words, the P-bombs, all the stuff all came back to the Stormers. It was, it's been a while since I've been in like Newlands or Cape Town Stadium when the Storm was on doing well. And <laughs> it, it felt homely, actually, just hearing those swear words and, 
and people popping off like that in the final. So it was it was one thing that I was like, oh, this is familiar. I, I remember this when people are angry at the Stormers for something. I just love people's anger, like in at stadiums in general. Like, I mean, I, I always <laughs> go watch rugby at a bar, like I watch any big game. I like watching it at a bar. Um, and then, like, I remember last year when the box were playing Argentina, the, the game where we had to where we had to win. And like you always get those like those unrational fans who are just angry. Like if if any call goes against the spring box, like whether it's a knock on, fair or not, like he's gonna be like, Ref, come on, man. And then <laughs> so what, what one of the ones I think Franz Stein had missed a, a penalty, kicked out a uh, dead in goal. And then I think then Argentina got it and kicked it out like from the 22 meter drop straight out. And then the guy says to me, like, as the spring box, as the Argentina was kicked out in the foot, he goes, Yeah. Justice, man. Justice. So I'm like, why are you saying justice? He's like, well, the ball's out dead in goal. He's like, yo, but if, if it goes out dead in goal, it's a five-minute line out. I'm like, oh, man, you're just angry for no reason. He's just making up laws now. <laughs> He's like, he was so angry. He's like, if no, if the ball's got... And he got so, so... I'm like, oh, man, like... But then he's, he's getting at knock-ons. Like, but before it passes, you'll, be, you'll still get angry. I'm like, oh, man, like... The guy's got to blow that up. Like, has to blow for the opposition as well. He, like, I've seen it, like, at Pirates at Joburg, I go watch. I've never actually ever seen him like really oh, happy. Oh. I don't think he likes sports in general. Like he's just like if his team is playing, if the Lions are playing or the Sharks are playing, I think it could be Rian actually. Maybe it's Rian. Rian knows in the stars. Like it could be Rian now if I think about it. Oh, brilliant. I actually enjoy um I've been to Pirates. Pirates and Hemis have uh, have played a couple of games against each other. We've had a couple of guys mm. play for both. So that's quite I've been there once. Pretty cool spot. But and I, I tell you, fans and supporting of teams is very interesting. Um, I've got a, a very good mate of mine, Rob. I mean, we we swim a lot and run a lot together and whatever. And we chat a lot of rugby. And, you know, it's good good conversations. But if the Stormers are playing or the Springboks are playing, like I don't, I can't even pay attention to what he's saying. I just can't because I lose my head <laughs> because it's exactly the same. You're just like, dude. What are you on about? Like that is absolute rubbish. It's a lie. And it, like if it's two of the same things happen, then it's it's only right if the other team get penalized for it. But if his team gets penalized for it, then it's a wrong call. And then so I have to like switch myself off. Like I can only have these conversations when it doesn't involve his team. <laughs> but people go <laughs> mental. So mental. this this sounds like um, friend of the show. Uh, let's not let's not say it. Let's, let's leave it there. Um, sure. <laughs> we're I'm talking the about <laughs> what was happening in the in a certain quarterfinal um, earlier this year as well. But let's move to our 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 mailbag for the week. Um, we asked people just to share their questions. I'm going to start with one that wasn't on the thing, which is just some recent news. So we've had, I guess, in the afternoon that we are recording, um, the Sharks have announced their coaching team for. For the next season um and yeah i think people in durban have reason to be happy and excited and obviously you guys are two sharks fans um so neil powell's going to be director of rugby for the sharks as we know john plumtree has been appointed as head coach as we all know then the skills positions are joey mohalo who's been obviously the the curry cup coach the sharks are, are second there in the curry or first i think i'm not sure first or second in the curry cup um He's been the defense, he was the defense coach for the Bulls as well. And they were successful for the Lions for a while. And they were successful as well. So him coming to become the defense coach is a great thing. Attack coach is Dave Williams, who was the attack coach for the Sharks in that shortened um, COVID season 2020 when it looked like the Sharks were just about to dominate world rugby. Warren White has moved to the forwards. When Kerwin Bosch was when Kerwin Bosch was was putting up his hand to be first choice Springbok Flaff. That period. He was floating. Oh my goodness, he was floating that, um, that like, whatever, half season, if you want to call it that. You've got Whiteley and Philip Lemmer as forwards coaches. You've got Pierre Nomlomo, who's, um, I think he was a skills coach for, for basically the last year or so. He's now the kicking and exit um, coach, so he's been basically doing that as well. Also good news for J.P. Peterson, um, who's now the head coach for the juniors as well. But, Sean, I'll start with you. This is, yeah, I... I mean, the last two seasons, we've been saying like the Sharks look like a team that meet each other on Friday to play on Saturday, but this is serious. Um, now, as a, a non-fan of the Sharks, I'm like, oh, okay, we have to actually be taking these guys seriously. Yeah, I, you know, I think the biggest part of, of everything that 
what everyone was, oh, I've really messed that up, but I'm going to try it again. Joey was the most important um, cog in that. And that's what everyone was waiting for. So once Plumtree came in and once Neil Powell moved properly into director of rugby, we knew that there was things would have to change and, and, and they needed to kind of put personnel in place to make a difference. And <clears throat> they've done it. Like they've nailed it. The, the only like the only thing that I look at that I'm a little bit hesitant on is is Warren Whiteley in the forwards, um, which is a little bit controversial. I'm not going to make many friends, but I'm not 100 percent sold. 100 percent sold. I didn't say that he's not good enough. I just I just am not there yet. But I think with Plumtree there, um, with Whiteley there, and with that group, I think like he will do he will do much better. But that is a statement that the Sharks have made a statement there though. And, and to be quite frank, if they don't turn it around, like play as a like 30 to 40% better, just as, as, um, as with their current squad because of this setup, then there's something else seriously wrong in the union because that, this means business and it's flipping great. It's like a breath of fresh air, but like, let's be honest. Don't, Sharks fans feel like this before every season. <laughs> so, so all they've got to do is deliver now. <laughs> and the one time that it did deliver, it, uh, it was cut short. So, <laughs> But th- this is probably the most exciting and, and the, probably the best setup of, of coaching minds that the Sharks have put together, um, that they could put together. It's pretty impressive. But I, I completely forgot that Dave Williams was... Um, was the attack coach back then? Mm. I really did. And when Cooks mentioned on 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 the group, I had to do a little Googlerizing. But that's brilliant. Like there's a some great balance there, and it looks flipping epic. Imagine Joey and Dave get the team to buy into both of their two concepts, just them two. Like imagine, mm. imagine what would go would go down there. Yeah, and I think some people are saying maybe Joey's being like sort of. Um, what do you call it? like almost like prepared groomed. for the role of being the head mm. coach when John groomed there we go once John Plumtree leaves so that would be great for him as well but a, um, an assistant Cooks, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry I'm oh. sorry the, the defensive role how often have we seen those defensive roles in teams more as an assistant mm. coach and he he comfortably fits into that as, uh, assistant coach as someone else uh, like Whiteley I think probably as a whole could could be in that mix but joey's like he's a great defensive coach but that stuff we saw this week about what he was saying to apalela fussy and the conversations he was having like he we all know and everyone wants Mm. him to take the step up like it sucks that he's not a head coach already but if there's a clear plan and this will allow him to really like hone his skills and be in that assistant coach space he could easily move up into a head coach role for any club union, glo- like globally type setup, or into an assistant role in the Springboks. Like, yeah, I'm super happy. Cooks, then, yeah, I mean, you have you were saying now you've had your best weekend in a while, which is probably because the Sharks and Chelsea aren't playing. So I'm assuming you're looking forward to now much happier weekends with this coaching staff. <laughs> Hello, why am I do that to me? You know, I'm, I'm trying to be a bit... <laughs> You're going to remind me of my team's, all my team's failures. But um, yeah, it's a very good. I think it's a, as good as a, as a coaching lineup we can have anywhere in the, in the URC. And and um, so it, it's, uh, it's exciting. You know, I think, uh, like Sean said, our Sharks fans don't need much to get us excited. And then, <laughs> so, so when you see... Um, Just the start of a season, does it? Yeah, we, we always have, like, un, <laughs> like there's such, such massive high hopes for, for no reason. The, the Sharks could have, like, a mathematical chance of like having to win like the next eight games straight, like make the playoffs. We'll, we'll, we'll think we'll do it. Like we, we'll, like whether you're playing like Toulouse away, <laughs> Leinster away, Crusaders away, we're like, yeah, we win all eight. Like, I mean, it's, it's, like, that's how we are. So like, we don't need much rationale to con- to convince us to be, support the Sharks. So to actually have a proper, it's, it is very stacked uh, coaching, coaching lineup. So I'm excited. Um, I think, yeah, now, I think that with that issue sort of being solved with coaches, I think now the big one for the Sharks, obviously how to manage the gap between the Springboks and the Springbok players and sort of the rest when, because obviously like we always mentioned, the Springboks or the Sharks will always be away, especially now with the World Cup. 
So those guys are probably oh, they they they're only playing next year already. So so it's gonna be interesting to see how they how this coaching staff does manage that. Hopefully, Dave Williams does bring. We saw glimpses of of the old Cohen Bosch this year at the start of the year. So I'm sure someone like Dave Williams will bring that out up in the Sharks game plan. Sort of something we've talked about, like not know what the Sharks not knowing what they're looking to do on attack. So we know Dave Dave Williams will get those guys to jail again. Is a fantastic attack coach. Um, it was gonna be obviously lacquer to see Plum back in, black in black back in Durban. Um, back so in yeah, black. very keen to see. Yeah, back in black. So, so it's gonna be keen. I mean, yeah, I'm keen. I'm very excited. Hopefully, just hopefully we just <laughs> we just do a lot better than, than than this season. Let's hope so too. And surely, as you mentioned, um, there was a quote from um Graham Hallow from the um I think just prior to the last Curry Cup game, and he was talking about just encouraging Apelele Fassi to take that next like step up in the, in, to the next level. And you're saying that Apelele Fassi is basically at a crossroads where it could be a person that plays 200 games for the Sharks and never again play for the Springboks, um, or be a person that plays 200 games for the Sharks and have 50 to 100 tests for the Springboks. And he's, that they've basically told him like, on the things that he needs to work on um, in order for him to to get to that next level. And yeah, I think that's just, just to echo what you were saying, Sharky, that's great. And coaching is great words for him. And I think I, I don't mind in this, like in this context, putting the public challenge for Fassi as well. Like he's been a player for a few years now. He's a settled sort of figure in the Sharks team. Like he's uh, almost like, I wouldn't say a senior player, but like he's, he's been there now for a while. So now that the, it's the challenge is on him now to be like, okay, you're now sort of in your mid twenties. You're now starting to hit into your prime. Like, do you just want to be a person that like plays really well for the Sharks, has a few like awesome tries um, in this level, but doesn't really kick on to international level, or do you want to be one of the best players in the world? So I think we all know what Fassi's deficiencies are, especially defensively. So if 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 Joey can really get into Fassi and and, and motivate him and and help him to to grow into those things, like yeah, we. That's that's a great thing for obviously for South African rugby in general as well. And if that's the way that he coaches with people in general, I think that'll be good. So yeah, very excited to see what the products of that are. As well. So let's go into some of the other things that um, people are asking us about. So um, Shobs was asking us about rugby world cup group stage upsets and Maybe we can also talk about what the hell's going on with the Welsh rugby team at the moment. But Cooks, yeah, we have uh, out of the, in the in the four groups. If you want to talk about sort of the third best teams or the fourth best teams in each of the groups, in Group A you've got Italy. In Group B you've got Scotland and and Tonga. Maybe in Group C you've got Fiji and Georgia and Wales. I don't know if you consider them a minnow now. And then Group D you've got um, Japan and Samoa. Cooks, which one of those teams do you think is the most likely to maybe make a run into the Rugby World Cup knockouts? I think we've, I mean, we've, we've spoken it quite a bit, especially after the, um, especially after the, well, first of all, Shops, shout out to the Shops and good luck for your comrades this weekend. Um, oh, yes. Uh, He's been training. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Every no. day. I, I've, loving, I've been loving following, following his journey. But yeah, it's the big yeah, one this weekend. Awesome. No, it's the big one. He's World Cups in June. Um, but um, <laughs> I think uh, <laughs> I think Fiji's the big one. I think I mean Fiji and Georgia are probably the big one, obviously with Wales. Um, I mean, if we were Welsh, we probably had a, could have, have a crack at Megan that's why the way they're also just dropping out like flies. So um I think Fiji Georgia's the big one. I think obviously Fiji can sort of and Georgia would target beating Wales and then sort of making it a shootout with each other to try and see if they can sort of sneak to a quarterfinal. I think the nice thing for Say a side like Wales, Tala, you mentioned it as well. As if I'm sorry, Studio Thunder, like if you, if, if, if Fiji or, Wales, or Fiji or Georgia gets to a quarterfinal, they'll fancy themselves against an Argentina, Japan, or England in a quarterfinal. If, the, if you're a minister, if you ever want to be, it's like the complete opposite of the, the dog fights happening in the other side of the pool. So like if, if, if you're someone like Argentina, you'll be thinking, I mean, so if you're like Fiji, like, look, if we can get a quarterfinal, we can make a possible semi final run. But um, I. I think for me the big one is early early take is Scotland. I think Scotland either goes two ways. They either like knock off either like one of the Springboks or Ireland, or they lose to Tonga. 
So th- they're going to be involved in an upset, but I don't know. If, I don't know whether it's going to be good or bad for them. Like that's the <laughs> that's that's the worrying thing of what Scotland. They can go either way. That's so, such a great shot. Yeah, that's so such I think a great Scot- shot. Oh. So them are worried. It depends which it dep- yeah, which Scotland you get in the day. Like, they, could they beat Ireland and they, could they beat the Springboks? Or they just could you know lose to the Springboks, fall apart, and then Tonga picks them off. So I think Scotland's going to be my big upset watch for good or bad reasons. Yeah, I I love that as well. And we know that Scotland can be world beaters one week. You know, either they beat England or run France close or even beat them or run New Zealand close. And then the next week you're like, oh, okay, they've just lost to Wales or something like that. So that is definitely in the question. Yeah, I I like I, I think I agree with you, Cooks. Georgia and Fiji must be looking at Wales and seeing absolute food there. Say and and saying to themselves, look, we can beat them. At the very least, even the Wallabies, I mean, depending on how Eddie Jones gets them going, like there is a chance to get at least a few wins there. And then obviously that the match between those two will be epic in terms of trying to decide who who goes where. And historically it seemed like it's historically it's been Fiji that's had the wood over Georgia because there are obviously two different styles of of game plans and teams. And Fiji sort of like running rugby always gets around Georgia's like more like forward based dominating, but they're also starting to run as well, to be honest. And then, yeah, Sean, I just want to turn this to the other side for Wales. <laughs> what what the hell's happening there? Like in in about three weeks, they've lost three people, three players to retirement. Um, Alan Wynne Jones, Justin Tipperick, and Reese Webb have all retired. Probably all have been told by Warren Gatland, uh, you won't be in the World Cup plans. And then they released this statement on social media about Reese Carr and say, well, he basically hasn't meet, met the expectations for fitness, so we've dropped him for that. Not sure why they had to publicize the reason for that. <sighs> Sean, I don't know if this is feeling like 2003 comes stalled or not. I don't know what that is in Welsh, but it is yeah. feeling a bit like the team's falling apart here. Yeah, and they've lost Navidi as well, eh? Um, so, oh, yeah. Like... <sighs> You know, just I just want to go back to what Cook said. A pool C is definitely the one for me, besides the obvious of pool B with with Ireland, Scotland, South Africa. But you know that Georgia and Wales play each other as the last game of that group, eh? So yeah, I mean, imagine Wales are chasing a win and imagine Georgia are like, cool, we want to get a result out of this. It could really could really be something. So that's that's gonna be something. But yeah, Wales, it's it's very interesting. Like, I, everyone, I've seen a lot of people on, on socials are saying, cool, everyone's jumping ship because of whatever is happening and being said, you know, or, or Gatland has said to the guys, like, you know, we want you to be front and center. I even saw one take was like, Alan Jones, you're going to be front and center. Um, and, and he then retired because he's, he feels he didn't need to be there. Like, they need to bring other people. I I think it's a little bit more of a balanced conversation, um, and maybe there were ex- some things were expected. Uh, you can't really like with so many guys retiring, but it's very it's weird. Like there's something going on. I mean, it's an absolute shit show in Welsh rugby as it is. Then um, bringing Gats back, then coming off all these losses. Um, then that other the other stuff that's going on on the professional side with the with the the union or the clubs, um, it's crazy. Oh, and let's also not forget that oh, forget his name. The center, I want to say Hawkshaw, but it's not. Um, that Hawkins. youngster Hawkins, he's also not there. Like they could mm. really have used him, you know. Um, Tompkins was out of favor for a while, but he's obviously going to come back in the mix. But yeah, it's it's really weird. Like I, I feel bad making comments on it because I really don't know what's going on. It just looks like it's an it's just an absolute like house fire. So, but yeah, we'll wait and see. The one thing that we've we've always said is like Gatlin can get a team together. He can if he gets the right people involved, um, he gets his right people in and they buy into him, then you know then he can get a team together. And they're not going to play expansive rugby. They're going to be playing rugby to win. If it's by one point, so be it. Like, they're not exactly going to go out there and try and smash all the records. So, 
if he's got everyone together, maybe these guys didn't buy into it. And he was like, cool, you guys are not going to be part of my, of my team anymore. And maybe gave them an opportunity to, um, to do it on their terms as opposed to him <clears throat> leading them on and then just not announcing them. I don't know. But it's going to be interesting times ahead, man. Very, very interesting. And yeah, it's uh, going to be challenging. But Wales are... They play... The thing is, is we know what game they're going to play because they, we, we play such a similar game to them. They're going to keep their forwards going. They're going to play 10-man rugby as much as possible and then take their points. So, yeah. The only thing and that I found very tough is just how they dropped um Reese care like that whole social media announcement about basically saying listen <laughs> you chubby fuck you need to go now like <laughs> I, I, I i don't know what they <laughs> plan oh my goodness. i don't know what they plan on gaining by that exactly <laughs> hey they use those words exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon, I reckon those words. <laughs> like I reckon they use those words in a conversation, and then they were like, "Cool, let's dumb it down for socials." I don't know, but it's bizarre. Goodness. It's b- <laughs> oh fuck. Anyway, sorry. Excuse my language. Bro, yeah, sure. Bro, sorry. Rather, this r- rather fat shame in public. There's no need for the, the whole of Twitter to know that I'm like, why I'm dropped. Like, make up an excuse. So I can't hear drugs. Or well, just <laughs> say he's not available. He's been dropped yeah. or released. Like this is the first time I've ever I've ever seen like a reason, a fitness reason in in rugby like that. It's bizarre. And the thing is, is he's playing pro rugby at the moment. It's not like he's, it's not like like Farid Dupriya before he um before he rejoined in 2015. Was it 2015? Yeah. Like before he rejoined, he he played in Japan, but then he was off for months and he was training with the Bulls. Like if they turned around and said, Farida Pereira can't go because he's not fit enough, everyone would be like, cool, we totally get it. But I mean, he's been playing in the URC. Like he's not a terrible prop. And they kind of need players at the moment. (laughs) But anyway, let's see what happens. Interesting little side story about a World Cup circus going on. Jeez, and I think imagine now teams are now honest about why they're dropping players. Like, yeah, <laughs> you know, we're dropping, you know, we're dropping um Marco van Staden. He's just not good enough, really. Or we're dropping Gaka Smith. I mean, or Jasper, Jasper Visa. He's getting too many yellow cards. We're talking about twenty twenty or something like that. Like, yeah, I think we probably as as fans we want transparency, but maybe not that much transparency from our teams. Yes, he man. And the thing is, when you put it out in the open like that, people use that as as like ammo. Yeah, you know. Yeah, like that's, that's the, the horrible thing. And it. yes, and he's and Kara K K said like he's talked mm. about it because they I think um, Pivak said something similar earlier this yes. year or earlier last year, and he was saying he was struggling with that for a while. So yeah, this is I, I Wales is not giving themselves any easy wins right now, and you know I think from a union and a team standpoint. <laughs> What you need to do right now is just post all the like look what the Springboks are doing with their like World Cup preparation content. They've been doing that, like what do you call it, that medicine ball, volleyball um game. They've been showing Lutiacha with his mullet, they've been showing Sia Colisi with his rehab. Like, do content like that. Like that makes people happy and like proud of the team and all that sort of stuff and brings good vibes. All you're hearing from Wales is just they're working hard. Everyone's sweating, and now this player's gone. This player's gone. This player's gone. It's like a game of Survivor. But but the WRU is like the poster child for hold my beer. <laughs> like whenever anything Jeez. happens, the next guy's like, "Don't worry, I've got the Twitter. I got the Twitter login details. I'm going to show you something." And then the next guy's like, "No, hang on, <laughs> I got this." But listen about that. The Springboks and and playing their their soccer thing when. Willemse, I was reading the caption, Willemse does bicycle. I'm like, oh, please, I don't want to. <laughs> like, imagine he lands and he breaks his wrist and you're like, well, funny mm. thing. You know, we were having such a jaw and then like a random training ground injury. I'm like, yeah, no, don't want to don't want to do that. But it's such a fine line between like cooks. I mean, 
it's such a fine line between keeping guys fit and contact ready, but then also wrapping them in cotton wool. This must be the absolute worst time for coaches and for everyone. It must be an absolute worst. No, hundred percent. Because like what like it's I've always like it's even like even like warm up games, like how of how many games you play someone, how long do you play them for? Like you need continuity, like you need some guys need games to play, but like you don't you don't want someone getting injured and now also doing like bicycle kicks. <laughs> yeah, practice and you're like oh, are you kidding me but it must be like the most stressful situation I think I think now so players kind of know like how coaches feel about them because like let's say Demi Valencia does get injured doing a bicycle kick like you know you you know like the, the coaches really want you to go to, the, to be available but like all the, all six coaches around you like t- ticking your ankle seeing if you're fine like, and then someone else <laughs> took a bicycle kick and it's like you know it's just the physio like are you okay like yeah I'm fine like what the coaches say I oh, don't worry about it don't stress you can keep doing your your bicycle kicks. But the forwards, like the forwards are <laughs> with the with the greatest amount of respect for these world class professional athletes, forwards are like a whole bunch of baby giraffes running around more often than not. They've got zero footballing skills. Like there's no hand feet coordination. <laughs> they just barely have <laughs> hand hand eye coordination. They just like catch and carry, you know, there's like this running kick. Like and they're like trying to kick a ball and, and he's going to like, I feel like he's going to wrap his leg. You know, those cartoons when they try and kick something and miss in the leg, like <laughs> wraps around the other standing leg. I can see this shit happening. <laughs> I freak out, at man. Least like the, <laughs> at least they were like playing a match match, just like trying to like, like do like, well, because I mean, when I used to coach and the kids like, so can you play soccer? I'm like, there's no way in hell he was playing football. <laughs> he, first of all, like, it looks like, an, like he's, he's clumsy enough. He can't keep a rugby ball in his, in his hands and it's, and try and run up straight. Now you, you want to, now you want a football where you can go, you got sides, you got like, you got eight stud boots, you tramp on someone's ankle. Or like, you could <laughs> worse, like damage yourself. Like, like it's like, it's the worst, like it's the scariest thing. And you're like, oh, what like we fun make them play. But you're like, what if someone does get tramped on? But like, imagine, like, imagine, if, imagine Malcolm Marx, like it, him tackling is one thing, but a slide tackle from Malcolm Marx or France by Halba came with a two footed tackle. Now we've got no fly off a scrum off for the World Cup. <laughs> Or Francis running to to thing and then he trips and then lands on someone. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I can't. I can't do that. Imagine. Imagine we we lose someone. But anyway, it's done. And they put it on social and obviously everything was fine because there's been no injury announcements. And Khaleesi's (laughs) been dancing up a storm. I'm so confident that he's going to be back, eh? (laughs) No, he's he's the best. It's the best. Yeah, he seems like he's going to be all all okay. Was it? I think it was the England cricket team that always had like before matches, or was it Australia? Oh yeah, it was Australia because Glenn McGraw like rolled his ankle, I think, before an Ashes Test. They were always playing like soccer or something like that for warm up before Test matches, and they always lost a player for injury. Might have been England <laughs> as well, but like then they were like, okay, we're not doing this anymore. We're not playing football, and it it went away for like two years. It's now back again, but like. You just get a few of those sort of warm up injuries and all that sort of stuff, and then the medicine balls, the frisbees, the dancing that goes away very quickly. So maybe, yeah, yeah. maybe there is a reason why but, Wales is being so serious the whole time. Yeah, but you've got to break it up. Like, imagine being in camp for like six weeks, and they're like, "Okay, everyone, run around the field. We're gonna do some Broncos, and then we're gonna do rucks, and then do lineouts." It's <sighs> normal. <laughs> so yeah, there you go, guys. It's it's like getting a free lesson in school, or when the teacher. I mean, I'm old enough. Like when the teacher rolls in the the TV, you're like, yes, man. <laughs> There's no school today. Yeah. We get to watch TV. Anyway, there's going to be some PE teachers doing that in the World Cup, I'm sure, as well, rolling in the TV. So let's do some <laughs> very quick. Yeah, I think we call these quick taps. Um, once upon a time. But I just wanted to hear very quick like answers about some of these other questions that were in there. So, Cooks, I'll start with you and then Sean, we'll just go, go on and on like that. So, Tiana Stoffberg was asking about the five things you want to come away with after your RC season. Let's keep it to like one thing, one thing that either stood out for you or a lesson or something that, yeah, you just want to talk about about the URC. Cooks? Oh, I think, uh, like I mentioned it last week in the final, I think I'm. Um, Having the true, true north versus south sort of final in Munster and Stormers and sort of being able to experience and truly experience like different cultures and having the Irish come down here. And, and, and I really hope that with the URC, that's, that, that's the lasting legacy of this year's URC. And it's something that going forward we can build on where 
hopefully we can have more traveling South African fans going up there, having more fans from Glasgow, from you know, for these Italian fans coming down here and sort of experiencing it and sort of getting the best out of each different cultures and we get to learn like spend time with like Italians and you know guys from from, from Wales because of Scotland. I think that will be the beauty of the competition and, and sort of and sort of give us a true true test of North versus South. So I thought we saw I thought we saw it in the final and that was the sort of lasting memory of the URC. So I hope, I hope more of that. Sean? Mine's a South African one. I want the Sharks and the Bulls to fix themselves because that will bring more competition. They must be more consistent. So um, the Sharks are on the right step, and I think Jake White's been building it with the Bulls, even though it hasn't shown, but it's, it's going to have to show. And even if it's not with Jake White, I think it'll show. But be more competitive. So forcing, um, forcing sides to bring a stronger squad down, which will then bring more of what Cooks is after as well. Like if we make it, remember super, super rugby competitive was you play your best team every week and, and we all miss that. We can't be super rugby competitive in URC all the time, but we can, by making our team stronger, we can force everyone's hand a little bit where Leinster know that they've come down and they have to, they have to win one ga- or two games. Then they can't send the youngsters all the time. And, uh, and that's what, so I think the Sharks and the Bulls are the key to that. Um, they can lift it up a level and challenge and put pressure on the other people. I think as a whole, everything will come together. Yeah, I think uh, breaking news, Sean hates the Reese Ruddock All-Stars. Um, next question um, from Shobs again. And apologies is, to Ringo for not mentioning the Apologies. They, 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 of they, course. They're, they're feeder school, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, just sticking to the URC. So, Shops also asked about what's going to happen to the Stormers' backline if Leeds and Galant are coming back, as is rumored. So, Sean, very quickly, your Stormers' backline if Galant and Leeds are in Cape Town next season? Galant at 15, Willems at 12, Lubbock at 10, and Leeds um, on one of the wings, whichever one of your wings you want to replace. I don't mind. Probably on the left for now, but he's better on the right. Um, yeah, I'll put him on the right wing and then you can make decisions about left wing. Okay. Cooks, you want to, is there anything you do differently there? I mean, all I can say to that, the, the famous Twitter Cristiano Ronaldo mean that goes, all I can say to it is, um, I will love it. And I think I deserve. <laughs> <laughs> no, that will absolutely cook. We need, yeah, just, just at least for entertainment purposes, Boogie needs to come back. And if, if it's late as well, no, we will definitely deserve it. Next, um, so Harry Jones asked us about socks. Cooks, are you a short sock person, like a James O'Connor cough, um, cough tickler, or a long sock person? Oh, short socks all the way. I'm, I'm 100% <laughs> a short sock. You're asking me, you're asking a person who's a forward and his favorite players all back line players, and you ask me if I wear long socks or short socks. <laughs> Silly question, Tyler. <laughs> Did you think it was be the world's longest socks? No, I'm a, I'm a, I won't say short. I, I'm like, a, yeah, like just, just, just touching the, the cards. I mean, like, I think it's just been like five minutes before every game I used to play, just making sure my socks were the right length, just for, just to be superstitious. But I'm a, I'm a big um, socks down type of guy. Cooks, are you, um, <clears throat> are you, are you, are you a sock, sock, shoe, shoe kind of guy or, or are you a, a, a sock, shoe, sock, shoe? No, I'm a sock, sock, shoe, shoe kind of guy. I'm not a heel buddy. <laughs> Mate, I am. <laughs> I don't I trust am, people. I am like, right. Like, oh well, then you're in trouble, mate. <laughs> I'm a right sure, foot. Like, I'm a right? right foot guy. I'm a right foot guy, oh. and I'm. I, to answer oh it, I, am, I, I get my. I get my. My socks are, are are up the whole way, just below the knee. So if they need to fold, they need to fold. But like towards the end, there they had those like those tight those socks that didn't need to be folded down or or guarded up. But yeah, no, I get the right sock on all the way up, all nice, the right boot, fully tied, properly, everything, 100%. And then I get onto the left. And my socks must stay so up the whole game. Now you're like, your left foot now is just going to be just cold for no reason. Just like, it's just floating there. <laughs> like, like, like I, don't, I never understand like, like sock shoe. Like, that is like, it, I don't understand that order. It doesn't make it like, it never like makes sense to me. Like, no, <laughs> like yes. so your other foot just like chills there. Like, while you put your socks, like, like, your socks are right there. Like, but no, I used to, I used to be socks up a little bit. 
I used to be, so, but my socks like I used to have like those old school the garters, but then the garter never used to tie properly, so it always used to drop. So then eventually I just kept it down. I was like, you know, I like I, I liked having the socks down. I was like, I then I just never put them, I never ever ever again put them up. Tyler, okay, next too. one. No, no, no. You oh, um, I, I, I would wear long socks, but I like the players with um, big calves wearing short socks. So are we going to talk about the top 14 um, barrage? But um, Tuisova, when he's making that run with his short socks, amazing. Next, That's only because his next, socks can't physically, they literally cannot fit over those calves. That is, that's a fair point. That's an absolutely fair point. <laughs> Jeez, what he has... Like I was watching with my wife and she was like, I've never seen calves this big. And I was like, I've never seen them as well. Like those are basically biceps on his leg. They, but they're like Johnny Bravo calves. Like they, they come down. <laughs> they, there's no round. There's no rounding of anything. There's like this lump of muscle. And then it's almost cut off at a right angle going into his leg. Like there's literally, it's, there's, it's Johnny Bravo. <laughs> there we go. So... Sean, Spelelo Kumalo just said Gregory Aldrit. I have no I idea what that. to do with that. <laughs> I think you, we just, yeah. he wants I, us to I talk about it. with Gregory Aldrit. Yes, <laughs> you too. He Gregory is Aldrit, the yes. best. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Massive exclamation mark. It's it like on those, when someone, when, you know, on, on WhatsApp where you, you can reply to a message with an emoji, we'll just put a massive green yeah. tick there. Dink. Done. <laughs> Cooks, do you have anything to add to Gregory Aldrit? Exclamation mark. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing I can add. I mean, he's, he's, he's answered, he's asked and answered his own question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Gregory Aldrit question mark, Gregory Aldrit exclamation point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good player to love, no. though. So he's a very good player to love. Speaking of players to love, um, it's we're celebrating 40 years of. Um, Times um, journalist Stephen Jones um, writing for uh, writing in rugby and writing for the Times newspaper. He released his uh, apparently a dream fifteen for the past forty years. I just have one question for you, Sean. Is Mike Phillips your? Uh, as Rian Lowe asked us, um, shout out to Ringo. Is Mike Phillips the best number nine in the last forty years? Yeah. <laughs> And then he got a lot of heat afterwards. And then he had to clarify why he was asking that. Rest in peace mentions. Um, it, uh, what, what a crock. Listen, he was a good rugby player. He was, a, he was good. And I think because of his personality, go back to the beginning of this podcast, um, because of his personality, he wasn't probably as big as, as you know, afterwards everyone was happy to hate him. Um, but he was good when he was playing for Wales and he was on form. He broke a lot of hearts, literally and figuratively on the rugby field and off. Um, but um, yeah, no, he's no man. No, he's, he isn't the best <laughs> in the last 40 years, but, but he knows that good. as well. So it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Big fishing expedition there from Stephen Jones. Yes. Cooks, who's your random player that you want to put into a dream 15? Oh, random. I don't, I don't go with Mike, uh, Mike Phillips. Though. I mean, that's a that's a that's a, that's a tough one. I think <laughs> a random player. Let me. Hmm. I can't, probably probably Finn. You know, over Carter and all the guys, which will get me in a lot of trouble. <laughs> um, I, I get enough stick about the uh, Farrell and Wilkinson thing, so I'll probably I'll probably have to go with. Actually, you know what? I, I, I'll give a radical one. If I'd have put anyone in my world 15, I'll say 2002, at, at number seven, 2002, Joe Van Niekerk. I was in grade, grade four. Ooh. It was one of the greatest. I mean, he went, he went as a player of the year that year. He was fantastic. I still remember him Big Joe steaming down. Bobby Skins that gave him an offload on the offer line of Loftus and just powering through, powering through I the Wallabies. I forgot they played together. Oh, they... love me some Big Joe Van Niekerk in 2002. Now, if I did like pick a year, like, imagine... I'll take that, that Joe. The top imagine of how imagine how much it pissed off all because you remember back then rugby was very much like this is this is an african sport you know and then we've got two of these english flankers like and playing wild they're like not playing flanker and eighth man rugby that wasn't that wasn't how that wasn't in our dna then and they were playing wild stuff man like 
crazy, crazy. And also, it, it didn't help. We had Werner Kreev kicking the match winning kick, but he was he could barely kick her. He could be <laughs> and Brent and Brent Russell was playing at ten. So it was like it was like <laughs> people were like, what the hell is going on with this team? <laughs> There's no structure. <laughs> That is, that is actually my should be my one. Brent Russell, whenever he used to come on at ten, like come on the first five minutes of an injury. Brent Russell at ten was an absolute menace. Do you know he was a flipping good causing havoc. footballer? Eh? I think really? he might have played SA schools. I, I think he might have played Ooh. SA schools. Yeah, he he was uh, that doesn't, very doesn't good. Surprise me because does not surprise me the pocket rocket. But imagine <laughs> imagine him imagine him stepping you. Like, because I mean, we, he clearly could step when he had a rugby ball in his hand. Imagine him coming at you and dribbling a, a ball and sending you the wrong way. No, thank you. Ankle breaker. No, 100%. <laughs> Do you have any random you'd put into your Dream 15, Sean? No, um, I, I was having a little chuckle inside when you, when you sent that hospital pass to Cooks only to then realize that it was coming <laughs> my way and I still haven't prepared for you. Um, yeah. <laughs> Who would No, it's I... fine. We can Yeah, okay. we can skip this Thank one. Goodness for that. Yeah, Thank you. Thank you. There's many why why there's why, why, why yes. don't I skip it? I don't I'd like I'd like flip and take eyeballs here and like try and defuse the situation and then it shows like, you know what, it's half no. time ready. Let's, let's just go to the shades. Like Cooks, I've got <laughs> I've got a Connor Murray box kick for him. Don't worry. Uh, I knew I'm something lining was it up. Yeah, I'm so rolling it to the back of the rack. I'm just the caterpillars just, forming. Just, is Keith Sean, ready. you better get ready. ready. I'm stressing here. Yeah. I must open up all the tabs here and start Googleizing. <laughs> I don't know what, but yeah, I'm going to you, try. You're going to feel like Julian Savier in the 2017 Lions tour. Yo. So one, <laughs> one came in very fresh from Nick Woolley. Um, a radical law change for the better. Is that for me? Yes. I'm going to take it. I'm going to take it. Okay. A oh. radical law change for the better. Allowing an accidental knock-on as a play-on. So no forward Ooh. passes are allowed, and you can't obviously intentionally do it, but if you are, if the ball gets passed to you and it grazes your fingers, it's, it's play-on. Or if it goes in, in and out through the hands, play-on. Okay. Cooks? My one would be, this is my biggest, one of my biggest like, pet peeves in rugby. You're allowed to throw in the ball, skew at line out, and you don't, have to, you don't have to feed the scrum straight. I don't understand why a, a, a opposition can make a mistake and then I must still, there still has to be like a 50 50 contest. Like, no, like I should be able to throw the ball to my 10 if I want to as skew in the line out. Like, this whole thing was like, it doesn't make sense to me. Like, we had the contest, I, then, you, then you made the I, mistake. Now you got another contest. I almost, feel, like, I almost feel like you haven't watched rugby in the last five years. This is literally <laughs> happening in front of our eyes. It's, it's, yeah. it's a free-for-all, mate. Yeah, it, it is. A, like, but, then the, but the thing is, like, like the women rest of they don't normally call skew line But it does, you're like, nah, you want to call a skew line I'm like, nah, you want to. <laughs> like, I don't understand. Like, I just, I genuinely don't think, like, that should be in the law saying, like, obviously, there must be a new, but you shouldn't have to, like, say, for example, like, the line has to be like inside left. It's other also throws to you. Like, I understand it's like they want a fair contest, but like you have the chance to make a fair contest, then you kick, then you have the ball on. So like, surely I should get some <laughs> sort of, a, like some sort of advantage. It's like, what if like you're a team with a good pack? You're like, doesn't matter. We just won the ball back again. So it's like, <laughs> so you're like, what do you do? Or like have the option of a, or have an option of a like say a, a quick tap, so like a, like a free kick. Bring a, bring back ELVs actually, essentially. Spring the ball oh. more now. Yeah, it's 2008. Yeah, like, it's like, I just feel like if you're like a lesser pack, for example, like, you, you know, you should get like say, listen, we can't scrum, so we'll either get a, either a quick tap or we're going to, we, we're allowed to, the least we can do is, is put the ball in skew and then we can actually play from there and still, and still have some, and have what you call it, an advantage from the opposition making a mistake. Mm. I think I've got a better one than, than the two presented here. Rugby games should be 30 minutes or half, and we should stop the clock for, for scrums, formation of scrums, formation of lineouts, and for kicks. Let's actually get, if you guys want 60 minutes of ball playing time, let's actually do it, and let's do it properly. So it might be that now rugby is going, going a bit long like um, the NBA does, but at least you're getting now back, bang for your buck. So I would... Stop the clock for scrum formations. You can have a clock that says you have to form a scrum by in like 30 seconds or whatever. But 
Stop the clock for that. Stop the clock for lineup formations. Just get all of that filler out of it and let's just have action-packed rugby. That is so interesting. And it reminded me, so <clears throat> this weekend I I watched three games uh, in inverted commas top 14 because the one was a playoff. But So I've watched top 14 during the course of the year and watched French teams play in the Champions Cup and Challenge Cup. But I, I haven't really watched only French rugby. And the weirdest thing I was watching last night and I thought to myself, these lineouts seem so much quicker. And I want to, I mm -hmm. want to find out now, like I want to go back and have a look because you know, you know, like in, when the ball gets kicked out and they're getting set for a lineout, there's enough times for a replay of something or a, something to happen. And then the, the TV like goes back live and then the guys are in a huddle and then they're only walking to the lineout. And then the hooker gets ready after he's had a chat with the prop you know, about the line out call and then they throw it. That wasn't happening in the top 14 this weekend. It was like, it was like they, the ball was kicked out. They had a chat while walking to it. And then the, the often <laughs> when, when the, when the camera went, when the screen went back live into, into actual gameplay, the hooker had already like, had already like loaded the gun and sent it in. So sometimes they, they nearly missed the line out throw. So it seemed much quicker. Just the thought. Hmm. Actually, maybe let's use that as a segue to talking about the weekend's action. So, yeah, let's start with the top 14 playoffs. So we had the Le Barrage, as they call it in France, for the top 14, which are the playoffs for the semifinals. So actually two away wins happened this weekend. We have Stade France losing to Racing, 33 points to 20, and Bordeaux winning a bonkers game against Lyon, 32 points to 25. And I think the first place to start is with Madoš Tamwe's um, performance and match-winning performance for Bordeaux. And Sean, yeah, it was a weird seesaw match. Um, like at 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 one point, I was like, I'm I'm actually not sure why Leon is not winning this game by more because it seemed like they were controlling position and territory. The scrum was a lot better before Falatea came on. Like they were getting what they wanted, and you know, Sopago's starting to 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 to. And put things together. Tuisova was amazing, of course. And it just felt like, okay, Bordeaux is just pretty much holding on. They're, they're playing away. Like, it doesn't look like they're going to win this. Then Falatea came on. Um, Tuisova was, um, had to come off injured for whatever reason. The Leon coach um, took off um, Kulu and, um, and Lima Sopoaga, and the game changed. And then it, it, it really changed when uh, Madosh Tambwe got the ball in the last 20 minutes and he carved up um, Leon. So let's start with Madosh Tambwe's tries, Sean. Like, I, I don't think, uh, I mean, there's many, uh, there's, there's many places I'm sure they can do this, but there's just a way that Tambwe just took that gap and he just went. Incredible. And I just want to start with something. Madosh Tambwe defensively that whole game was brilliant. Mm. He was he made that try saving tackle where he held up uh, I can't for life me think who it was, but he held um, one of the Leon players up over the line. What obviously looked like a certain try because it was Arnold. Um, Arnold took a, a break and then Madosh Tambwe held him up. Um, but there, earlier, um, uh, sorry, a little bit later after that there was a moment where he made a defensive read and shot up in the line and made a tackle on uh, a ball and all tackle. Brilliant. Also, I would put that down as a try saver because there, there was an overlap coming. He was great. There was a couple of times like towards the end of the second half where it looked like he, he missed a tackle on, um, on Veridamu, but um, he, he did enough to tackle him into touch, like put a foot on, on, on touch. He was brilliant. On to the tries. So that first try, he basically just said, like, I've got this. Um, it was Leon had a man in the bin, Bordeaux had two. It was 13 v 14. And he's gone on a run. Like, a ball, I think the ball was grassed and he picked it up and went, broke a tackle and then just cruised into space and then stepped someone yeah. and then ended up stepping again to finish. Brilliant try. I thought that was the match winner. Only for... Um, Leon to come back. I think it was all tied up at one stage, but then he went and probably yeah. scored the match winner. He's got 
gas. We know he's got gas, but he's really like he, it's his spatial awareness that is along with his speed that is that is so good. Um, that try that he scored the second one, there was many people complaining about a double movement. I don't think it was. I think it was more case of of placing, but I don't think he was properly held either. But I don't think you can scratch that try off. I think that was uh, that was a legit try. Um, but flip man. He's literally, he's literally, he's put in a very close on a man of the match performance. Um, and he wasn't quiet in that first half. He just didn't get ball for attack, but defensively he was properly in the mix. He was working bloody hard. Yeah. And I think just in terms of the match, just talking about the match in general, Sean, I mean, I, th- I think you watch a lot more top 14 than I do. Like I try to catch it once in a while, but that was just, even for top 14 stands, that was just a crazy match. Like it just, it was a seesaw for most of the game. Like you just saw random moments of magic from, you know, from Kulu, from, from Jalibe, you know, all the, a lot of the, you know, French superstars and players are going to probably be in the front squad. They really all came out to play in this game. Taufi Fanua was causing havoc um, in the close contact as well with his big body. Cretan played well. Like, Everyone that is anyone had had some sort of good contribution to the game. Mortier had a good um, break. Um, the youngster, I think that was the first time I actually watched him for a full game. Um, Biel Biari, the the nineteen year old, like yeah, he's he's good. <laughs> he 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 didn't he didn't do anything like flashy, but he he did like he was he was very solid and very like calm in a game like that. Cordero had a, had a few good moments. Luku was kicking the pants off the ball willis was great like just a amazingly crazy game of of top 14 rugby and bordeaux finally getting the the win away from home as well which was massive and i think this is their first semi-final appearance in a while right um no oh okay my bad no i'm I'm i thought i saw something but i might be mistaken i'm sure i'll have a look while i chat the you know the thing for me. So during this, the top fourteen season, they play home and away. Um, it was one one with the home teams winning in the final round of the um, of the top fourteen this season. Every home team won. Away wins are very unusual, and having two away wins this season uh, in the in the in the barrage games is is huge. I couldn't believe how. Um, how badly Bordeaux were getting drilled at scrum time, and it was insane. Uh, it 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 really was like it it blew me away, and it was very yeah. Then there was uh, Bordeaux made some subs. So Gabriel Ogre, who we all remember from Wasps, who plays flank or, or yeah. hooker, him and Kalash Vili came on, and the tight head proper Falatia. Their first scrum absolutely decimated Leon. Like flipped Jeez. them on their head. Um, hectic, hectic. And it was from that moment that 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 Bordeaux were like, okay, we're we've got a foothold. So I think Leon are really gonna be bummed about how they how well they did in that game and didn't probably put more points on. But then they dropped their head. Uh, I think they kind of ran out of gas. I think everyone was going on the same on the same sort of sort of plane and then Bordeaux just managed to pick it up the one thing that I I will say that I was super surprised about is Bordeaux were down to 13 with a prop being sent uh, yellow carded they then (laughs) got another warning and on half time um Leon then scrummed them and got a penalty try now I just want to say if Leon can feel hard done by about anything, it was the fact that they didn't send, um, they didn't give another yellow card there. So have I got my games mixed up? I think I'm right. I think you have because, yeah. No, was that the, did I? I think that was happened. <laughs> that happened in, in the, the study game. game, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, I think let's just talk about that one quickly. I think basically the game turned pretty much with that Crema uh, red card, right? Oh No, we can't, we can't bounce between games. Surely. I'm sorry, my my <laughs> fault. I had I had this whole one open because I have all my games open in chronological order, and I was busy. Uh, but just just on that, it was a flipping 
the, just the way that Bordeaux came back into that game, Jalibert was brilliant. That try that he scored, which was also questionable, mm-hmm. so they had no TMO in yeah. this game because there was a technical issue. <laughs> um, so there were a couple. To sorry, be fair, just, I, I think Sean, it just to pause there, very, sorry, Sean, just to pause there quickly, Cooks. Imagine Supersport just being like, yeah, the cameras aren't working today, so we're not going to have a TMO for this URC game. That's pretty much as I understand what happened yesterday. Like, France yeah, is so random. Like, <laughs> that's still like the wildest thing. I could, like, I saw that, like, I was on the tweet. And they're like, sorry, there's no TMO today. Cameras aren't working. So, anyway, good luck <laughs> for the uh, quarterfinal. It's like, what? <laughs> like, like, that cannot be. <laughs> Crazy, man. Like, and then it came back for the last... For oh, the last um, Tambour try, I was like, you can't now have the TMO come in late <laughs> into the game. No, we but doing Jalibé, one field call for the whole game. Do you know oh, Jalibé's oh, try would not have stood, eh? He, yes. So it was brilliant it was because he, he cut the line. Like, it was brilliant. It was, he, he had a great game, eh? He really did. Like, mm. yeah, see, France are so spoiled now, man. But the, he had such a – he took that break and then he dived. He was being tackled and dived for the line. You know when you, when you dive and then that, that – before the line bounce, before you ground yeah. it, mm. like when you ground it beforehand, and he loses contact of it. And then they give it, and I didn't know what the hell was going on. Like I'm listening to the game in French, and uh, so I don't know what's cracking. And fortunately I saw it on <laughs> social that there was no – no TMO. And then the rest of the game, I was okay. Like when something was given and they didn't check it, I understood why. And then Tumboy goes and scores and they go upstairs. I was like, what the hell's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> I think Diaby also, Diaby also exactly. knocked on his try for, for Leon. I mean, for Bordeaux as well. Yes. Oh, imagine. Imagine. It's the World Cup. I just want, if one game in the World Cup, that'll happen. I'll be like, hey, there's nothing we can do. The cameras are working. And the thing is, to, to be fair, there's nothing, there, there literally is nothing you can do. Like, guys, I don't know what to tell you. Like, so there's no TMO today. So, so you might as well play <laughs> and just hope for the that's best. A, yeah, that's okay. Everyone did, was happy we played rugby and didn't have TMOs in the past. It's just, I thought the ref actually handled it very well. Like, yeah, there was, was no great. long, there was no arguments or long holdups or anything. Um, the, you know, I think the biggest, the glaring, the, one of the biggest things was late on in the game. Um, Leon, uh, sorry, Bordeaux were in trouble. They took the ball back and then Luku smashed the ball into touch. And uh, the ref gave the line mm. out uh, in, in Leon's half. They could really, it was like, it wasn't even Luku, I think it was someone else. But, um, but yeah, Leon could really be done with the line out 18 meters from the line, to be honest. But other than that, like, I thought he handled it well. It was a case of uh, chat with the, with, with the AR and, um, yeah, you happy with the try? Yeah, cool. Let's go. Boom, done. And then the crowd was watching the replays on the big screen, just <laughs> shitting all over the referee. And the ref's like, whatever. Yeah, you know, like, <laughs> play on. Yeah, that, <laughs> that was just such a wild French thing to happen. Sean, um, quickly to move on then to the, oh, one last thing. I have no idea why Jean-Marc Toussaint is still playing, like, top-level professional rugby. But he might be. It's I'm sure it's off. just that he's really good when I'm not play when I'm not watching. But no man, Dusan looks no man. He looks round now, like you know, like late Piriwipu. Like he's basically rounded in that. Like we need to stop this. <laughs> he actually followed us on Instagram last week. So, but anyway. Oh, sorry. I I retract no, everything sorry. I said. <laughs> he, so he. I actually watched him play last year or the year before, and I thought exactly the same thing. And then he came on, and he, he but he is, he is end of, end, end of career, pretty weepoo, like he's just getting a little bit bigger, bigger, bigger each each season. And he's playing mostly at 10. So, I mean, he's, yeah, he's had a pretty long career, but uh, I did have a chuckle. There was, there was also, an, oh man, listen, like, let's be honest here. Um, in our in the Curry Cup, we've got a couple of guys, a couple of guys running around in the back line that you're like, nah, really, <laughs> really. But yeah, but he's still playing. Yeah, he's. I, I, I'm yeah. sure I heard someone say something, but I think he's got another year or two left in his contract, or maybe he's going year on year. I'm not sure. But uh, goodness, yeah. <laughs> the older you get, Let's, the closer you get yeah. to the scrum. <laughs> Let's switch gears to the um, wrestling study game. Sean, you'll have to sort of lead us here because I didn't watch this game as well. Um, yeah, all I saw was Marcus Kramer 
doing his Th- Thomas Lavanini impression. Maybe I'll just ask Cooks now quickly. I mean, I know you have your fin stocks and you're keeping them, so I'm sure you're very like um, disappointed at at Kramer for 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 his clean up there of fin, of fin's head actually. No, but but but, but Kramer is a. I'm disappointed, but not surprised. I don't know, and also it's like he's trying to. I don't know why um, what Kramer did. To... <laughs> disappointed, but not surprised. I love it. That is amazing. <laughs> Yeah, like, I mean, it's, it's what Kramer does though. From Kramer's either gonna, Kramer's either going to be man of the match and have twenty eight tackles, or he's going to get red card in the next five minutes. Like in the next, next game, in five minutes time. There's no in between that. Up. But um, he tried to kill my man. He tried to he tried to kill Finn before. Like uh, I, I don't I don't like seeing stuff like that. Like it, I saw obviously pop on social media, and I was like, and it's never a nice seeing attempted murder on the timeline. Like it's, it's never a good thing to see <laughs> while you are scrolling on Apple it's a Saturday night. And I go, it's like watching us trying to catch up with what's going on in the world, and your favorite player almost almost, almost dies because because someone just came flying in the head. Oh, geez, yeah, that was you, yeah, that was it was terrible. But the thing with Kramer, you, 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 you like I said, you could do that again in a couple of months' time when he gets back. But yes, yeah, he what a what a clear cut red. Like it was Cameron Wokey that kind of saw him coming and he got in the way or I think he actually helped <laughs> Finn out a little bit. Strangely enough, Finn Russell only went off for an HIA like a, a minute or two afterwards. Bizarre. But anyway, he came back. But yeah, three minutes in, eh? Kramer, red card. Thanks for coming. You're playing at home against Russing, who, to be fair, have been a little bit wobbly this season. But yeah, that, so now, I mean, you guys may have heard this, but Stad Francais can feel pretty hard done by. After things, after being down a man and then conceding two tries, um, obviously, which is what you'd expect, but then started dominating at um, at scrum time, and ended up giving um, uh, Russing lost shot to a yellow card. Then they lost Eddie Benarus to a yellow card. Now Benarus had just come on. Because um, they were struggling. They were struggling at scrum time. So they took off, uh, was Gogiashvili. And they put Eddie Benarus on. He makes one scrum and then they yellow card him. So they were in trouble. Then many talks by the ref. Stud Francais are dominating at scrum time. And they get a penalty try in the 45th minute. So it's like five minutes of injury time. But he doesn't freaking send, he doesn't send anyone off. Now that was massive for me. Um, where I really think that there should have been another yellow card there. But, yeah, and then the second half was pretty much one-way traffic. Like, well, no, it was that's a little unfair. But Finn Russell had a very good game, kicked really well, um, and Russing just clawed their way back. Like, they just really got, got in, got in um, into Stade Francais' faces, just did the business, built a score and got it going. And, oh, Jeremy Ward, who's had such a good season um, for stud. Um, unfortunately, he was they were running from in their 22 and they got a f- couple of their lines fluffed and he couldn't make a pass and he had to hold on. And he got hit really hard and spilled the ball and Fiku scores and that was basically the end of the game. So you are rushing into the semifinals playing Toulouse and Bordeaux into the semifinals playing La Rochelle this weekend. So it's going to be absolute freaking screamer. What's your pick, Sean? I, I don't see Russing getting over Toulouse. I don't. Um, but Toulouse after a week off, and most teams, but Toulouse after a week off are funny. But I think they're very focused at the moment. La Rochelle, Bordeaux is going to be flippant brilliant because La Rochelle have come off back-to-back Champions Cup performances, but they haven't won the top 14. So they're in almost uncharted territory. Not uncharted, but they want to finish it off. Like, it's big. It's big for them. Um, but La Rochelle, if they, if they address Bordeaux the way they did Leinster, they will clean clean up with, against them. Clean up. So I'm going with the two home wins to lose La Rochelle final. Yeah, I'm um, keep in mind that it's at a um, neutral um, venue at San Sebastian. Yeah. The semifinals. Yes, they they always play the and semifinals and finals at a at a, a pre pre arranged location. Yeah, 
Cooks, I don't know if you've already sold your racing stocks. Are you going to be backing them to, to, to pull a surprise on Toulouse? You see, that, this is the perfect time to, 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 ca- to cash in <laughs> on your racing stocks now because the most dangerous time with racing is when they're underdogs. Don't bet on them when they're favorites. This is the time you must bet on racing. This is, I think this is, whenever, they have, whenever they have too much, too much form, you know, they're playing at home, that's then you know it's gonna only gonna end in tears. So um, I'm backing them to pull a surprise and um, pull a surprise and, and sort of find themselves into a final. And then the heartbreak can commence. That's when the heartbreak can commence. <laughs> I want them to have hope. I want them to have to, 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 to get to start, start hiring people to make documentaries for them how they clawed their way back from and then for them to lose. It's coming there. So they're gonna win. They're gonna win this weekend. I'm I'm backing racing to win this weekend. So I I have a question for you. Obviously, you're, you're, you've got a racing jersey, which is, which is blue and white hoops. Um, with Finn moving to Bath, which is white, blue, and black, are you just going to color in one of the hoops and wait for your Bath jersey, <laughs> or have you already got your Bath jersey? No, I'm, 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 I'm yeah, sure it's expensive these days. The cost of living in South Africa is higher, so I'm just going to color in <laughs> just one of the hoops and just hope for the best. <laughs> 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 with all the French sponsors on it, but it'll have it'll have Russell and Ten at the back, which is cool. That's the only thing that matters. Yeah, that's, that's all that matters. And, this, and, and, and the, the, some people here in they don't know which jersey I'm wearing. They, 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 must just, they think it's an old school province jersey for all they know. So like, so they don't know. Who it is. So we're fine. I thought it's an old school province one, like like '98 or something. Just Russell. Like, well, Russell, no, full Russell. No, no, no. <laughs> Oof, Russell, so I'll, say, I'll say it's Russell Bennett. Just, Russell Bennett, just, yes, I'm just, just going to say. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> put his second name, put his first name. Just, <laughs> that's where I'm going. Brilliant. Okay, let us go into Super Rugby now. They have now sorted out their playoffs. They had their last round of fixtures um, in, over the weekend. Uh, let's actually talk, it, talk through it with the, the quarterfinal matchups. So first of all, the Blues are facing the Waratahs. Um, Blues won against the Highlanders in a relatively boring game. The Waratahs decide to send off Michael Hooper, you know, who's lost probably his last home game for the Waratahs with a loss against Moana Pacifica, which is poetic um, <laughs> at this stage. Um, Cooks, there was also, um, I put up a, a, a Twitter poll, it actually got a, a bit of traction about the best open sider in the last, um, in the professional era for the Wallabies. Actually, it was surprising the final results that Hooper was was third behind um, Smith and and Pocock, but Pocock won that quite easily. Um, you you said you you had your team George Smith in that, right? It's the only right answer. It's the only right answer. <laughs> I know Pocock was great. George Smith, unbelievable, and freaking. I remember as a kid, like oh man, George Smith, like incredible fetcher as well. But arguably, arguably the most skillful forward to have played. He has. His hands were incredible. Oh, quick. Like, he's basically like Pocock and Hooper wrapped into a player. Like what, like what Hooper was doing, like Joe Schmidt was doing, but he was, he, was, he was an incredible fetch. He gave Richie McCaw. If it were Richie McCaw, I think like George Smith could have also won multiple world players here. But like, that's, oh mm. man, George Smith, was, George Smith was incredible. And I, mean, I love David Pocock. I mean, I mean don't, don't get me wrong. I mean, like, I know he was a fantastic fetcher, but David Pocock is arguably the greatest, like, of, is, when it comes to Malta, he always just scores tries. I don't know what he does. Like, I don't know what he says. I don't know what Muti he has where he, somehow when he's involved in the Mola, he, he always ends up scoring. Like, he's always the back there. Like, but, um, yeah, I would have definitely gone for... It's Paul, I mean, it's uh, probably it's George Smith. Oof, that's tighter than Pocock and then Hooper for me. There, there, is a, there is a time there would have been a window where you could have played all three at the back of a scrum. It would have been a window. Yeah. Because they all played at the same that, time. That like last, last George Smith, I think he played for, was it the Brumbies? He played for like half a season or something like that. And it he could was, have been a Smith 8. It. Yeah. Smith 8, Pocock 6, Hooper 7. Ridiculous. Yes. <laughs> Crazy. So yeah, let's maybe get into predictions. Blues versus Waratahs. Waratahs coming away from home. They... Pretty much with the best of the rest from the top five. Blues, yeah, I don't know, sort of similar to the racing um, disappointment plan of they'll build you up a little bit to break you down. So, I, yeah, I would, I would say probably Blues are overwhelming favorites, Sean. 
Yeah, I think overwhelming is is correct. I don't see the Waratahs winning that at all. Cooks, so yeah, the Blues, they're going to delay things, right? In terms of disappointing their fans. Yeah, I think they'll get to the semi. Not yet. It's still too early. <laughs> okay, and then the next game is Chiefs versus Reds. Reds just about get, um, just about qualify for the top eight. They were thrashed by the Fijian Drua. We're going to talk about it in a moment. Uh, but they managed to qualify through some favors from other teams as well. So they qualify on points difference. Their reward is playing the top-ranked Chiefs. But interestingly enough, the Reds were the only team to beat the Chiefs um, this season. Um, so, you know, maybe maybe Reds have something for them. Sean, do you think the Reds have something for the Chiefs? No, Reds have come off. <laughs> Reds have come off two losses, <laughs> and and not like they themselves have admitted that like, they were diabolical and didn't deserve to make it. Chiefs are are cooking. They are really in tune with everything. But it's yeah, I think they. I don't think it's going to happen. I just on a side note. Fiji has always been a place I wanted to go visit because I really like diving mm. and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, that's my kind of vibe. But there's an added bonus of I want to go and watch a rugby game there. I want to watch a Fiji and Joe play someone. I don't care who it is because that looks freaking awesome. They are mm, mm. the fans, everything. It's just another level. They they. The Fijian Drua have become a side that you do not want to play at home. They are like home based. Like they will do everything. They will push anyone to the end of the game at home. A way that could probably be different. But they they are they've had such a great uh, intro into into Super Rugby. Like they're just doing well. They're growing from strength to strength. But I want to go to Fiji to watch a Super Rugby game. There's no doubt about it in my mind. Yeah, Cooks, I'm not even going to ask you about Reds versus Chiefs. Let's just talk about the draw and them qualifying. I mean, I think I'm definitely keen to join Sean on his trip to Fiji one day. It seems like the best, probably the best vibe in rugby in the world. Um, but yeah, <laughs> their reward for qualifying for the for the for the for the knockouts is a game at Christchurch, which is pretty much the worst game you can get in a knockout game. Yeah. Thanks. And, and Tana, thank you for asking me about uh, the Chiefs. <laughs> <laughs> and Reds game because they're up at six in the morning. Thank you for asking me. You know, and I'm not getting the scheduling and Sanzo and they bullshit. But anyway, um, <laughs> make it on Sunday. No, no, let me not start. Anyway, the Drua, yeah, I think it's it is really cool that um they, they are in the competition and it does bring in a sort of a, a little something special. But you're yeah, flipped to get the Crusaders in, like in Christchurch. It's like it is like that's just the, the meanest possible. Welcome to your like first ever Super Rugby playoff. Like this is the what this is basically like that's the hardest game in probably club rugby. I don't think Rays has lost a home playoff game since it's taken over. But nope. um, I want to ask you guys this. I mean, obviously Rays is leaving, and like a few Star Wars the Crusaders are leaving. Razor, if Razor leaves and they win the Super Rugby, Razor would have won Super Rugby every single year that he's coached the Crusaders. I'm not mistaken. <laughs> I think, which is ridiculous. <laughs> And then, um, and then obviously Moan got a one about, I don't know, five or six of you. I mean, surely, like, this is probably then the greatest sort of Crusaders era, right? And like, like surely Razor becomes the greatest Super Rugby coach. And, and the, like the conversation of Richie Moanga being the greatest ever 10 in Super Rugby, I think it becomes very, very real. Like, I mean, we'll love Dan Carter and Larkham, though. But I mean, they were the one Super Rugby titles, before, like when we're still all the SA teams in the mix and then sort of COVID came. It was a Super Rugby tour where they still carried on winning. They changed the competition. They still carried on winning. They, the only one they didn't win was, was the other one where they had like that random Super Rugby one where they just, no one played it. Like, oh, that, that, I can't remember they won the Blues. That fake one, the Blues one, because I think they played the Highlanders in the... Was Wasn't it Super Rugby, Rugby Unlocked? Yeah. Oh, jeez. that Yeah, the Super Rugby Unlocked, that weird Super Rugby one they had, which just no one played each other. Like, it was just... But, um, yeah, I think... Yeah, it's weird. Like, it's just, Crusaders, Crusaders missed out because they didn't have enough bonus points. Like, because, like, the Highlands, everyone, everyone was, like, like thumping the point Australian teams. But I definitely do think that Rich Mwanga and, like, Razor could, like, sort of make, like, very big GOAT arguments when they finish up. If they end up, if, even if they don't win, but if, especially if they end up winning. What do you guys think? Yeah, you know, that's a massive shot, but it's it's a good one. Like, Razor's dominated... 
um, super rugby. Like as a start, he just really has. Um, having said that, he really has had the absolute best of the best. But now, obviously, the blue the Blues did have a little run along somewhere. Didn't the Blues win it a couple of years ago? Anyway, the Blues and now the Chiefs are kind of in the mix. But Crusaders have got a different DNA when it comes to knockout rugby. Having said that, I think if there's any team that can really mess with the Crusaders vibe, it's the Fijians. Like, they can play loose and they can continuously do it, run from their own 22 forever. Like, they can run all the time. So if... If a couple of offloads go their way and Crusaders have to chase the game, we could be in for a screamer. Richie Moanga, now there's a great shot. The thing, the thing that detracts from him being called the greatest of all time is he had a little blip on the radar. And I think people have used that and have not forgotten about that. It's almost like they feel like he hasn't constantly grown in his sort of in, in, in his journey and that he had a little bit of a, a, a down up. But you can't deny it that he, from a super rugby only point of view, he 100% could be the GOAT. 100%. Yeah. Richie's my, well, Moanga, just, just to be clear, but he's <laughs> been my super rugby. Yeah, I, I realized there was a bit of confusion there, but Moanga's been my super rugby GOAT for at least a year or two now. I think it's just undeniable what he does and just how he turns up for super rugby. Like, He's, it's too yes, easy he's not for great him. in test rugby, but yeah, he just he just decides in like these big matches, and which is why I still think the Crusaders are going to win the whole thing. He just decides in a big match at a certain point in the second half. Okay, I'm taking over, and then he just does it. So yeah, I think this is pretty much him and and Razor are pretty much peak Super Rugby. Like I don't think we'll see better than than those two as coaches and player. Um, yeah, Sean, I like your shout for the draw. If they can get a few early tries like they did in the game against the Crusaders in in in, in Suva um, earlier this season where the draw beat the Crusaders, that's probably the recipe to win. Like, just throw them off. I know it was a Crusaders second team, but just keep it unstructured and keep the pressure on them by, you know, scoring a random try every, like, 15 minutes. Like, that is pretty much the, the, the draw's only way to try and keep up with them. But yeah. Christchurch, I think, is still the worst place to play a knockout game. You want you you want the halftime com- conversation from Razor and Co to be along the lines of that try that they scored, like it happens, <laughs> you know. And you ideally want them to say that about like two tries, not one of those tries. Mm-hmm. Like if we had done this, if we'd stayed tight here, or we were struggling to to mo- pick up sort of pillar and post, and and this is where the gap was like something that they can break down and say, cool, this is where we need to get better. You don't want that. You want them to have a conversation of like, where they just kind of tear up the, the notepad and throw it in there and walk off, you know, like how do you coach? What can we do to, to stop that try? Like the, the short answer is sweet FA. <laughs> like, there's nothing you can do. You put in a great tackle. The Oak has pulled out an absolute screamer offload between his legs around the back, looking the other direction and the other dude is grabbed at no looking, like, and then gone off to sprint uh, 60 meters to score. Like, that's what you want. You want them to be like scratching their heads going, I don't really know where you guys are playing badly to be down by 12. That, that's what I want to see. Yeah, so that, that will be the entertaining one. And then the actual, probably the only one that looks to be competitive, at least on paper, is Brambies versus Hurricanes. Brambies playing at home. Cooks, I know last week you said the Brumbies are your pick to maybe make a run to the final. So I assume they have to start by beating off the, the Hurricanes. Yeah, I think so. I mean, if, if they want to make any sort of run, I think they'll, they should beat the Hurricanes at home. They should. I mean, Canes uh, are, like I know it's obviously the Australian side, they struggled beating the New Zealand side. But I do think, on the back of the Brumbies, maybe Eddie Jones says, um, says a speech to the boys, reminds them that... Um, that, that, um, that they are a high quality outfit. So, uh, yeah, I think I'm still going to stick with the Brumbies. Yeah, and I think, uh, I mean, the Brumbies did, I mean, the Hurricanes did win that match against the Crusaders last week. They made a big comeback in the second half. And obviously they've got quality players, um, uh, Jordy Barrett, Audi Sevilla, Ruben Love has come back from injury as well. Like, yeah, they've got, I mean, they're, they're not a team you really want to face in a knockout game because they also can just sort of turn on the the, 
the craziness and, and get like quick tries out of nowhere. But yeah, man, I think the Brumbies are almost like the adults in the room. Like, you know, Valentini, Ikitao, like those players play like, you know, they try to get some control. Nick White, obviously controlling things from nine as well. Wouldn't be surprised if Debra Cheney, um starts for them. And then they've got that bit of craziness in their team with Tom Wright at fullback. Um, <laughs> I'm actually quite excited to see if the Wallabies play him at fullback. But yeah, I think the Brambies should win this, but it'll be a very, very close game. Sean? I'm, I'm torn. Torn between the Brumbies and, and, and the Bucket Hats and um, the Hurricanes and, and Corey Jane. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> whew, I don't know. Eh? I feel it's going to be... I feel the Hurricanes are going to put in a massive showing here. Whether it's enough for them to get over the line or not is obviously the biggest question and the current question that you're asking me. I feel that the Hurricanes are going to turn up and I'm interested to see what the Brumbies bring in order to, in order to win it. But I'll go with Hurricanes. Okay, so yeah, very exciting weekend of rugby um, happening. The actual the one last question that Andre Gil asked us in our mailbag was just sort of thoughts on Super Rugby and how to make it exciting. He went on a thread of talking about that in the other competitions, they're either fighting for um, qualification of the URC or they've got shields and they've got titles to fight for. When Super Rugby, it's just the title that they're fighting for. And it does sort of make it stale when you have eight teams out of 12 that can qualify for the knockouts. But I mean, someone else I saw on, on Twitter made a good point that like, if it was only six teams or four teams that, uh, that were qualifying for the knockout, then, you know, 90% of Australia would have <laughs> turned off their TVs by this time of the year. So I, yeah, Sean, I don't know. It's been a weird super rugby season with obviously all the players coming in and out with um, enforced resting from Australia and New Zealand. And it just seemed like as the, the competition is starting to build momentum, it then just sort of goes off for a week or two just because none of the big players are playing and or none of the big players are playing against each other. Like, yeah, I don't know what, or I don't know if you have any quick ideas about how to make this competition sort of go better in the next few seasons. So for us South Africans, we don't quite understand it because we hate derbies, but for the Aussies, it would benefit the Aussies the best and the most. They mm. love internal competition. They love, they love it. They absolutely, it's like they would probably, if they had an opportunity, if they had a chance, they'd probably just do Super Rugby Australia on a, on a loop. So the only way of bringing, it's really hard to bring in like shield winners when you've got two shields, two groups basically. So that's kind of challenging. But, you know, the, that would mean that have to increase the teams and all that, which we've all been down that road and we don't necessarily think it's the, the best idea. I don't think Super Rugby is in that much of a bad place. I think we're looking at it from a different point of view because we're not there anymore and we were used to seeing it more challenging with extra teams in it. But I think that they're fine at the moment. I don't think it's worthwhile bringing in, in pool winners or shield winners. but. Um, I do feel, so Moana Pacifica, ironically, out of the two new teams, I thought they were probably going to um, be better sooner, where it was actually the Fijian Drua that have, that have really pitched up early. And there's talk of Japan being in the mix for a few things in the future. So I don't know what's going to happen. But I think that they're okay at the moment. They just got to get used to the balance of this, and I think more the South African fans need to get used to the balance of it. And Cooks needs to find ways of watching rugby and at six o'clock and four and four a.m. in the morning. On a Thursday. Right, Cooks? <laughs> oh, Thursday! I'm still surprised there's no Super Rugby games. <laughs> here we go. Monday here evening. we go. No, but I, I like. But short is right. I think like besides obviously like saying adding in like the, the the teams from japan or i think obviously the most obvious one is trying to sort of find a way where you create almost something like a like like the heineken cup but a global competition where like top three qualify automatically for this competition top three urc top three and sort of have a global a global club 
championship, which, which, which would be fantastic. I just think, yeah, I think the, the hard part with, with Super Rugby, I think as the African fan is obviously the balance in power because of how strong the New Zealand teams are compared to the new Australian teams. But I always look back like the New Zealand teams, were, when we went Super Rugby, like they also dominated us as well. We just, we just happened to watch it more often. Like we just saw it happen in front of our eyes all the time. Like, but we saw that we were, we competed and we did very well. But but we're still New Zealand starts dominating the competition. But obviously for us, it's, they came here. And I think obviously now we're sort of looking at it from a way like we, we sort of, we sort of looking at it from like I know we're in the URC now, so we've sort of we moved on. And but I was like, yeah, but like we moved on from like a, an abusive relationship because New Zealand side used to destroy us all the time. It's like. So like it's so like I mean the Bulls have won it three times. I mean no one else's Lions have lost three finals. Sorry, Ringo, for bringing that up. But Lions have lost like you know they lost you know final shots and lost finals. So it's like it's not like so sometimes we sort of look like in a way like sometimes the good you've left like we like look at like Super Rugby like with our nose up like oh look at us we don't you know I'm like yeah but I mean like we were losing there too like I mean you know what I mean like we've but with a side in the semi final of the URC so it's like let's 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 before we judge Super Rugby too harshly, like, yeah, I, just, I don't know how they can change it, but I do think having a 12-team competition and eight teams can go through is not the way to do it. Um, yeah, that's, I, but, I'm sorry, I didn't yeah, even... Yeah, that's always the big one. Yeah, that's the big bonkers. one Like, how do you lose, and there were, like, there were stats that were being put out about, like, win percentages and how these people, uh, teams qualified. But I mean, the Reds, like the Reds haven't exactly been setting the Australian group on fire and then they go and lose two games in a row and still sneak in. Nah. Well, unless you're like, my thing is if you have, if you only got the A team route, then if you come first or second, you get a bye. You don't play quarterfinals. Like let the rest of them fight it out. Like it should have, have an incentive of coming first. Because maybe whatever, and after it does, when your team is eighth, it puts the team as number one. So I think maybe you do the IPL style. First two teams, or one of the two, they get a bye, they go straight in the semifinals, home semifinals. Then the other two, sort of the, the other teams, the other four teams fight it out for the for the other positions. Like, like, but you can't have like yeah, it's tough to have four teams it was already missing out. So I think that will be the change. But yeah, I mean, I think super. It's still, a great shot, you know. It's yeah, I still think it's a great product. I mean, when you do watch it, I think the harder part is because our teams are not in there, so it's hard to sort of go like like Talos mentioned the other day. Like, like it's hard to like. I'd love to watch the Brave in the morning, but I'm like, okay, cool. I'd rather do something now in the morning because I know in the evening the Sharks are playing at three, the Storms are playing at five, so I want to be available so, for, sort of for that time. Like, like, and, like it's, it's, it's kind of hard to see. Like, whereas before, it's like the Sharks are playing in the morning against the Crusaders, but you're like, oh, you might, I'll, I'll watch the Reds versus the Tars it's, it's straight afterwards in my zone. Whereas like now, we rather go watch a URC game because it's, because it's, because it's when he's watching, but I'm, as much as people like some on Twitter be like, oh, Sarebi is going boring. Listen, sometimes watching like a, a the Dragons play like Zebras, it's not sort a of fun watch as well. Like when it's when it's raining and it's um, it, there's also some tough tough watches in the URC as well. So I just think we need to scale and like, oh, Sarebi is going so bad. It's like we pump the brakes there a little bit. But the, you, you've, I think you've probably solved the problem in terms of how that they can keep more teams qualifying, but then also add an, an, an additional sort of uh, an additional thing is it's how the top 14 are set up. So team one and two go straight into home semifinals and then team three, four, five, and six play what was this weekend, the barrage. So you have six teams qualifying and then you have not, not a, like not a quarterfinal round, but you do, have in inverted commas a quarterfinal round, but it's only two teams playing. So, but it's the it's probably the best way of doing the current setup, uh, allowing them to have more teams qualify than just four, or what they currently have and have eight. But it's challenging. It's really difficult. But you know, coaches will be will be working it. Like, what better way to for the Reds to to hit their form? than to have a real, real diabolical lead up to the quarterfinals and then be in the quarterfinals still with another shout. Problem is if they don't take their chance, then you're just like it was an absolute waste. Yeah, I think, yeah, those are good. I think that's a good discussion on like what I think we can expect in the future for, for Super Rugby, just the perspective on us as South African fans coming in. 
into it as well. Like the priorities are just a little bit different for us these days. Um, I think let's wrap up with just very quickly talking it through the Curry Cup and just the permutations there. It's the last weekend of games for them as well. So pretty much the short story is the Cheetahs and the Sharks are through to the semifinals. And basically every other team except for the Griffins is in contention for the semifinals. So the Lions are playing the Griffins, the Lucky Fishers. So then they are going to be obviously trying to get five points from that game and put themselves in contention. But they still need some favors because the Pumas and the Bulls are the ones in the driver's seat. Um, the Pumas are playing the Griquas and both of them are going for a semifinal spot. So that's going to be basically effectively a knockout. The Bulls are playing the Cheetahs. The Cheetahs can rest players if they want to, or they can run the party for the Bulls as they've done over the years. And then we have Western Province playing the Sharks um, for the last game. And Province might be out of it by that time, but if they're not, they'll be basically chasing points against um, the the Sharks, who are pretty much the vibiest team in the Curry Cup right now. Um, I yeah, I, I, there's a lot to to unpack here, but I think it seems like the Pumas and the Bulls are probably gonna gonna stick into that top four spot. Uh, Sean, any th- any thoughts about the the Curry Cup? Yeah, I haven't watched a lot. It's just important to mention that the Griffins, I think they've only won once this season, and that was against a mm. URC star-studded bull side. That we can't ever take that away from them. And uh, it's important <laughs> that everyone gets reminded. Um however, the one thing that I really am looking forward to is the final game of the Curry Cup group stages is finishing in Cape Town with a Western Province Sharks game. I mean, how poetic is that? <laughs> it's gonna be it's gonna be amazing. And also with the with the Curry Cup, the Western Province side losing this weekend, struggling. Um, Dobbo said like he thought the biggest problem was uh, was what had happened by drafting in so many URC team uh, players. Um, Sharks uh, with some great defense and a whole bunch of wins on the trot. I think that's going to be a great little a little ending to the world's oldest competition. So Western Province, um, obviously the two-time, well, the Stormers are the two-time URC finalists. But Western Province, even though they have this big winning streak against the Bulls in all competitions, Western Province has a six-match losing streak against the Griquas right now. So I don't know how, I don't know where, I don't know why, but they have no idea how to beat the men from Kimberley at the moment. And I don't know if maybe Jake White is going to now try to get them into the team for, for the URC or what, what his plans might be. But Sean, that must be the most random winning streak in the world right now. Yeah, and I, I was so fortunate. Um, I did a bit of work with Griquas um, a while back. And um, I went to Kimberley for a game. And the game happened to be Western Province versus Griquas in a Curry Cup. And Greek was one. It was probably one of my best experiences ever. It was just amazing seeing what it what it meant and how it was. I had the best weekend in Kimberley, believe it or not. And uh, yeah, it was just a great a great experience. But you know, the thing about like these smaller unions, but the thing about Greek was is there's so much spice between the players. Uh, between Griqua players and Western Province players and Griqua players and the Cheetahs players because there's so much cross-pollination going on. Like there's 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 a big chunk of players that probably grew up as Western Province supporters wanting to play for Western Province that are not. So they have a mm. point to prove. A lot of with the coaches and a lot of like the the people like the management and everything between the Cheetahs and Western Province. Grick was like, you know, they get p- players poached. So any good player will get poached from them or they will pick up players that have been dropped out of their squads and then they've all got a point to prove. So it's flipping brilliant. And it means so much to them where if Western province had like a 15 game winning streak of the Grick it wouldn't mean anything. Like it doesn't mean what it means to the guys in Kimberley, you know? So it's flipping awesome. And I, I'm just, I was just so fortunate to be part of it for one for one moment, like coming out of Cape Town, like I had a couple of mates playing for Western Province. Shimmy was coaching at the time. I, um, I was doing quite a bit of work with Shimmy from a school, school coaching point of view. 
So yeah. yeah, he he. It was just like even me, like I was torn, but I also was part of that rivalry just purely from my very very limited like sort of time in the game. So yeah, it was it's amazing, and I absolutely love it. And it's such a motivation for them. Like you know that they that chat in the changing room is all about like we ain't gonna let this one slip. They belong to us, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, I guess yeah, it's just one of those things. But yeah, like it just seems to be that every team, that's every team has a bogey team. Ask Les Leinster with La Rochelle as well. Um, <laughs> La Rochelle with Toulouse, oh, and La Rochelle with Toulouse, and so the cycle goes on. Yeah, so yeah, I think the Curry Cup will have, will have to see what shenanigans happen um, on on the weekend, and then finally, I think we can wrap up on this. We've just. Uh, as we were recording, we saw that the France um, training squad is out. So this is a squad without the players still playing in the longest competition in the world, the UR, the, the the top 14. So it's te- it's players from the other um, 10 teams. Um, no real surprises, Sean, except at least for me, um, Arthur Vincent, Vincent play, uh, making the, the squad. Yes, um, great He's shot. obviously been injured the, the for the longest, so... That's great if he can make it, and he'll solve a lot of problems, especially for that backup to Gail Fiku, um, if he's able to be fit. So he's not even on the injured list of players, which includes probably the other surprise, which is Baptiste Saran, who's um, included in the squad, but as one of the players that are still injured. Um, I'm so happy to see it. I mean, let's be honest. Um, Dupont and Luku, who are still in in the top 14 semifinals and tournament are the first choice. But the other option is Legarek, who's who's um kind of seemed to have fallen out of favor but still in the mix, but he's with Rusting, so he's also not available. And Baptiste Saran has been brilliant for Toulon and unfortunately he's injured. So he's on the list but as as injured as with as is Paul Willemser. So yeah, I'm super happy for him. Listen, whether whether the third um, scrum half at the World Cup for France is Le, Le Garrick or Siren, it wouldn't matter too much, but they can't do wrong by having Baptiste Siren in the mix. Mm. And they've got a couple of youngsters. I know we were chatting about it a little bit um, off, off air, but they've named a couple of youngsters that aren't in the France under 20 squad traveling to South Africa. Huge. Yeah, so Mio Gaetan is in the is in the squad. He is, yeah, he's he's I think just turned twenty this year. We saw that he's born in Croydon. He has an English mom, right, Sean? Yeah, that's going to be interesting. I remember uh, you spoke about him, and you didn't. I couldn't quite place him, but then I, I checked him up, and I remember him playing in the under twenty six nations. He's a mm. flipping brilliant midfielder, back, backline player. I I wonder yeah. if, if the English are keeping an eye. Because according to Wiki, he born in England and he moved when he was three, but his mom's English. So he obviously, like, he doesn't, it doesn't matter. He can play for England whenever. But I mean, he's not living in England. So they, but I wonder if, they, if they've got him on the radar. I wonder. But to be fair, I mean, premiership yeah, sides aren't really, aren't really flush. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they do. Yeah. And maybe he'd that's a reason for fast. having him in the squad. Mm. Yeah. Um, I, I, there might be a mistake, but I don't see Roman Tafu Fenua's name here. I see his brother there. Surely, surely hmm. he's in, right? May there is only one in there at the moment. It's Sebastian. Yes, Romain. No, that must be a mistake. There. Or listen, the thing is about this is this is just a training squad. Yeah. So I'm sure if we really take a deep dive, we'll spot a couple of other guys that should be in the mix that aren't. Um, you know, it's the same as when, like, uh, when the when um, they announced that Springbok training squad and and um, Jasper Visser wasn't involved and all that. It's mm. just a training squad. Like, it doesn't say anything. You know, and even if mm. their squads are announced, like it's only up until the World Cup when they announce that squad, then you can have kittens about a player missing out. But yeah, so, but oh, that's an, that's interesting. I wonder if they, I wonder if he maybe picked up a little bit of a knock yesterday. Yeah, oh, yeah, maybe he's being rested. Who knows? Because he scrummed like a beast. It what it is yesterday? Roman, yeah. No, 
I'm trying to, I'm getting confused now between the two. Sebastian and Romain. Romain is the lock, isn't he? Mm. Yeah. Romain's sure. the lock, yes. I'm having a mare. Yeah. So, yeah. No, he had I a mean, good game yesterday as well. So. That is also not a bad squad for your top four teams not being <laughs> able, you not be able to pick from your top four teams. Ridiculous squad, actually. Crazy. It's crazy. There's like there's youth and experience. There's a little good little bit of balance. Louis Carbonell, Dylan Cretton. Yes. Yo. Demba Bamba. Gutierrez back in the squad as well. Sheesh. Anyway, beautiful. Yeah, they yeah. I mean your weekly reminder. France are gonna do a few things in this World Cup. <laughs> if you didn't know that already. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Watch out for them. There might be a surprise package. But yeah, Sean, I think we can wrap it up here. This has been a uh, a long one, but <laughs> we've traversed probably every rugby topic in the world. But yeah, I think we can wrap it up here. Or is there anything else you want to say? Shout outs, anything you want to mention before we go? No, I'm all good. Um, I, yeah, just uh, the last few weeks, the the women box of, were playing mm. in a tournament and won it. And everything's looking awesome um from the women's point of view especially after what i would probably call a successful world cup i thought we i thought it was great for for us um so yeah i'm super happy about that other than that no man i'm i'm thoroughly enjoying this semi downtime where we get to prepare for the chaos that's coming in september so <laughs> i'm excited yeah but i mean quickly on the women so by they won the african cup um that was the result that they had in the last few weeks. I think it was in Madagascar with like yes. a ridiculous crowds. Another place I want like, to go and watch rugby and dive and do whatever yeah. else. So, yeah, they have yeah. like basically the biggest or like pretty much some of the biggest crowds that you can have for rugby. So by them winning the Africa Cup, that means that they qualify the 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 world rugby started the the whole um rugby, I don't know if what they're calling it, but I think it's called the rugby championship tournament where the different teams are put in different pools and they play each other like over a course of a year. So, or over, over a few weeks, actually. So the woman, the, the, the box team is going to be playing in South Africa in the, in the second tier tournament with, <clears throat> excuse me, the fourth and fifth place team in the six nations. So that was Scotland and Italy. And then the, I think the, the fourth place team in the Oceania tournament that's about to happen between New Zealand Australia, Japan, uh, USA, and Canada, if I'm not mistaken. And then a playoff between Fiji and Samoa, so one of those teams as well. So in October, um, during the Rugby World Cup, there'll be a few weeks of, 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 um, of this tournament happening here in South Africa. So that's going to be a great opportunity to see the women's team um, up close and personal. And they're going to be playing teams that are pretty much at their level. So big chance for them to improve and big chance for them to hopefully get some wins and. You know, I think the next step for the box is to establish themselves as a top eight team. So they'll only do that if they play, you know, Scotland and Italy and those sort of teams, you know, as often as possible. Yeah, it's going to be great. Uh, side note, and a little bit off the topic, but Nadine Rus was in mm. Japan playing in a sevens tournament and she won play of the tournament. I, I think it was play yeah. of the tournament, but she won a big award. So she's cooking as well. Loving it. Does not surprise me. <laughs> no, she's a she's, machine. She's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, so I've just seen it's we have Scotland, Japan, and Italy in our pool. Interesting. And then we're just waiting for, I think, three other teams. And then pool one, or the tier one, I should probably say, is England, France, and Wales, the top three in the six nations. They'll probably be joined by like the last, the, the top two there. Okay, that is everything. <laughs> all your rugby caught up for this weekend thank you so much for listening to another episode of the rugby bits podcast please follow us on um, every social media platform um, on twitter instagram etc etc please go to our website to see when we post our new um, episodes as well and please like and share subscribe and rate this podcast so you can share it with the rugby world thank you so much and we'll talk to you in the next week bye <laughs>